Hi, welcome back. In today's session, I'd like to talk about uncertainty. It's something we face all the time in both business and investing, and it scares people. I, I admit it scares me as well. But I think there are both healthy ways and unhealthy ways of dealing with uncertainty. And in my view, the latter wins out over the former. So let's start with the basic fact. Uncertainty is a fact of life. It's always been there. It will always be there. That said, it ebbs and flows. There are periods of greater uncertainty and lesser uncertainty. But for whatever reason, each generation, each time period, we seem to think we live in the age of the greatest uncertainty. Why might that be? Well, I guess each generation wants to feel special. The other is, I think, a variation of hindsight bias. In other words, we look at the past and we look at what actually happened and we act like that's what you thought would happen at that time. I'll give you a very simple example. I talked to bankers and traders who were actually in the middle of the action in November of 2008, a period of incredible uncertainty where we were not sure what the end game was going to be and whether there was going to be a catastrophic ending. But if you talk to them, they're convinced that it wasn't as bad as it really was because in hindsight, it didn't happen. And that, I think, is something we do with a lot of past events. We act as if what actually happened was what something, somebody would have expected to happen at that time. But that said, there are some uncertainties that are specific to this particular time period. And that's, I think, one of the characteristics of uncertainty. It's a shapeshifter. The nature of uncertainty is never the same, which is part of the reason the tools we devise for the last uncertainty are not going to help us in the next one. And there are three reasons why I think we feel more uncertain now than we used to. The first is, and I've talked about this before, as interest rates decrease, I think the composition of our required returns and risky investments is changing. Let me back up and explain. The expected return on stocks in early 2008 before the crisis was about 8%. The expected return on stocks in 2016 is still 8%. You see, nothing's changed. Well, something has. In 2008, at least early 2008, of that 8%, 4% came from a risk-free rate and 4% from an equity risk premium. If you look at today's expected return, 2% comes from a risk-free rate and 6% from a risk premium, and that has implications. That 6% risk premium, first, is a reflection of the greater uncertainty we see around us. And the second, it does make all assets much more sensitive in both directions to news stories. And that's what you often see in these last few years in markets. The second is globalization is now a fact. There's no point debating whether we're globalized. We're globalized. Investors are globalized. Companies are globalized. There are good things that come out of globalization, but there are a couple of implications for risk that we have to get used to. The first is anyone's problem becomes everyone's problem. Back up again. I mean, think of the political chaos in Brazil or the fact that local governments in China might have borrowed too much to build infrastructure. 30 years ago, that, those would have been localized problems affecting the Brazilian market and the Chinese market if it had existed then. Today, those problems become global problems. So that's why we get crises rolling through almost every few months and waiting for the crises to pass is a pointless exercise because there's always another crisis somewhere in the world that's brewing. The second is, and this I think is a long-term shift that people are still getting used to. For a long time, the developed world bore less of the uncertainty. The emerging world bore more, more of the uncertainty. Asia, Latin America. As Asia and Latin America grow and become more prosperous, the balancing of risk has also changed. Americans and Europeans in particular feel more risk than they used to, and they should, because a lot of risk that they passed on to emerging markets are now coming back to developed markets. There's a third factor. I'm not a Luddite. I use a lot of technology, but I also think that technology has added to the transmission of risk. I mean, risk go viral. Something happens in some small part of the world. It's global in a, in, in a matter of seconds. And I'm not just talking about the CNBCs and the financial news channels. I'm talking about Facebook and Twitter, which have become our go-to places to get information as it happens. So it is true we feel more assaulted than ever by risks around us. Let's think about what our reactions are. The reality is human beings, when faced with uncertainty, behave in unhealthy ways. Here are the five most common responses to uncertainty. And if you have one of these responses, don't blame yourself. It's built into your genes. The first is paralysis and inaction. When faced with uncertainty, a lot of people just stop acting. They just wait. So maybe this will pass and then I can act. The second is what I call denial and delusion. And it takes one of two forms. If you're a number cruncher, it takes the form of adding more detail to your number crunching, more line items, more decimals, 
and acting as if doing that makes the uncertainty go away. If you're a storyteller, it takes the form of more and more elaborate stories where you control the ending. You feel really good about that ending, but you act like you control the ending. The third is what I call mental accounting, or what actually Richard Taylor calls mental accounting. And to me, that captures the fact that when faced with uncertainty, people fall back on rules of thumb, which are often based on nothing at all. Rules of thumb on how to value companies, how to make investments. The fourth is what I call outsourcing, where when you face a lot of uncertainty, you call in an expert, a consultant, the guy on CNBC. You turn to that person. That person probably doesn't know much more than you do about how this uncertainty is going to be resolved. But this way, if something goes wrong, you can always blame that person. And the fifth and the most and the longest term device used against uncertainty is prayer. There's a reason you go back 2,000 or 3,000 years ago that we used to have human sacrifices to make the gods less angry at us. We Maybe we don't have human sacrifices anymore, but we all have our versions of praying for divine intervention in the face of uncertainty. So these are all natural responses, and I'll confess I've had all any or all of them at some point in time. But one of the things I've discovered is when I let these responses come front and center, I almost always do damage to my portfolio. So over the last three decades, I've struggled, and I won't claim that I found the answer, but I've looked for coping mechanisms, and these are some of my coping mechanisms. They might not work for you, so you've got to come up with your own, but these are the things I fall back on when I'm faced with the most uncertainty. So the coping tools I'm going to talk about are not going to be cure, are, are not going to cure you of the problem of having uncertainty. They're just going to make them go to the background and perhaps give you more healthy responses. So here's the first one. I've talked a lot about how all good valuations connect stories to numbers. And when faced with uncertainty, I fall back on that notion. Because I discover when you're faced with uncertainties, you have lots of little pieces coming at you, lots of distractions. And you always have to go back to your base story for the company and ask, with all these uncertainties, is that story changing? Because if it's not, no matter how uncertain you feel, your value is not going to change that much. I'll give you an example. A year ago, less than a year ago, I valued Volkswagen right after its diesel emission schedules. Huge amount of uncertainty about the fines that might come about, what could happen, how the company would change, who the management of the company would be. But the reality was the story I was telling about Volkswagen before the scandal was it was a boring automobile company with low growth, not very exciting returns, and wasn't going to do much better than that in the future. To me, the diesel emission scandal didn't really make more than a little dent in that story. My valuation didn't change that much. The price did, which is part of the reason I bought Volkswagen. In contrast, when I looked at Valiant in November of 2015, this is a company that grew through acquisitions, borrowed money, and a very aggressive growth strategy. When I looked at the scandal unfolding, my reaction was, you can't go back to doing what you used to do because the story is now in the open. There, my valuation changed much more substantially because my story changed. Having a story will give you an anchor when you're faced with uncertainty. Here's the second. When you look at uncertainty, it's easy to get overwhelmed by the number of items of uncertainty. In fact, if you list a risk profile of every risk you're worried about, it could run to dozens of items. Put it into buckets. What do I mean by that? Not all uncertainty is made equal. When I think about uncertainty, I think of three classifications for uncertainty. The first is estimation uncertainty versus economic uncertainty. Let me explain. Economic uncertainty comes from the outside world. Estimation uncertainty comes from the fact that you haven't done your homework well enough. Estimation uncertainty can reduce or make go away by doing more homework, collecting more data, building bigger models. Economic uncertainty is not going to be dented by any of that. Here's a sad fact of life. When you do valuation, 85 to 90 percent of the uncertainties you face are economic uncertainties. Going out and looking for more data or building bigger models is not going to make that economic uncertainty go away. The second class in classification I use is micro versus macro. Micro uncertainties are uncertainties that relate to the company. Macro uncertainties come from the outside world, interest rates, inflation, political risk. Micro uncertainties are uncertainties that you often face in scandals. Macro uncertainties are uncertainties you face across time. Why do I make this classification? As you're going to see on the next page, macro uncertainties are the uncertainties I try to bring into discount rates. Micro uncertainties, it's my job to build into expected cash flows. There's no risk adjustment per se, but my cash flows will be lower because of those micro uncertainties. Third, I'm going to talk about discrete uncertainties versus continuous uncertainties. I'll give you an example. 
you're a U.S. company, the European operations, you're continuously exposed to the fact that the euro dollar exchange rate changes. Discrete uncertainties occur if you're a U.S. company invested in a country with a fixed exchange rate where there's no risk and no risk and no risk until there's a devaluation, at which point in time there's a huge amount of risk. Or discrete uncertainties is uncertainty you face when you face nationalization risk or distress risk. And the reason I make this classification is I'll make a confession. In finance, we're very good at dealing with continuous risk. We're not that good at dealing with discrete risk. And I have to deal with it separately than all of the other risks in my valuation. Because once you've made the classification, you have to decide where in your valuation you're going to put the risk. And here's the way I think about these different risks. Micro risks and company-specific risk I show through my expected cash flows. And remember, this is not a risk adjustment. I just give you an expected value given all the bad things that can happen for the company. That's effectively what I did at Volkswagen and Val Valiant because the risks I was thinking about were company-specific risk. Macroeconomic risks, exposure to interest rates, inflation, GDP, commodity prices, I show through your risk-adjusted discount rate. The estimation risk, I try to reduce by doing my homework and getting my expected cash flows and discount rate done right. Continuous risk, I can show through either the macro or the micro column. But discrete risk, I don't actually show in my valuation until I get to the end. And there I bring in the probability of bad things happening and what could happen in, that, in the event of that bad thing occurring. And then I take an expected value. Think of it like a decision tree. So the way I would do this for a distressed company is I'd do a discounted cash flow valuation as if the company is going to be a going concern. Then at the last moment, I wake up and say, what is the chance a company will not make it? I attach a probability to it, an expected value to what will happen if you don't make it, which could be zero for equity, and come up with an expected value for the company. The reason I do this is if I don't do this, I'm going to end up double counting or triple counting some risks and missing other risks. So take the time to break risk down and think about where you're going to shorten your valuation. Third, keep it simple. Less is more. When you're faced with more uncertainty, actually reduce the line items you have in your valuation. If I have 12 line items for typical valuation, I'll have only five when I'm valuing a startup. And don't sweat the small stuff. There's lots of small stuff in valuation. I'll give you an example of small stuff. When valuing startups, I spend very little time estimating the cost of capital. Why? Because it's the least important of my inputs. I should be spending far more time on revenue growth and margins than on cost of capital. Fourth, make your best estimates. When people say, I cannot value a company in the face of uncertainty, they're missing the point. You can value a company, you just have to make estimates, and those estimates are going to be wrong almost 100% of the time. That scares you, right? But here's the good news. You don't have to be right to make money. You just have to be less wrong than everybody else. That brings down your stress level a lot, right? So don't put the onus of being right on your shoulders. It's almost impossible to be right when you're faced with a lot of uncertainty. And finally, face up to uncertainty. I found that it's freeing to look at how uncertain I am about revenue growth and margins and cost of capital and actually make a picture of that uncertainty. I'm, I'm talking about a tool that I've used increasingly in the last few years when I value companies, which are Monte Carlo simulations, where rather than give a single point estimate for a variable like revenue growth or margins, I give you a distribution. I'll talk about this separately in a different post, but I think it's incredibly freeing to be able to see how uncertain you are and getting a picture of that uncertainty. And finally, be willing to be wrong. Eh? I think a lot of people invest think that if they do the right things, they will get the, the high returns. I've discovered that that's not necessarily true. In fact, it's often not true. You could do everything right and end up making nothing, and your neighbor could do everything wrong and make tons of money. Don't get frustrated. Because if you get frustrated, you're going to try to take it out in the market, and that never works for me. Maybe it works for you. Second, remember there's no uncertainty in the past. So don't keep looking backwards for ways to deal with uncertainty. It's always in the future. And third, when people talk about having concentrated portfolios, my response is you must feel a lot more certain about your valuations than I do. And when you feel uncertain, one of the things you need to do, even if you're doing everything right, is to spread your bets. Don't let hubris become your enemy. I've discovered that the more uncertain I get, the more I have to spread my bets. So if I'm investing in five companies when I feel pretty certain about my valuations, I'm investing in 20 when I face a lot of uncertainty. So finally, here's what I want to end with. Investing is a game, and if investing is a game, you want an edge to win at that game. That edge is getting more and more difficult to find 
in the flatter investing world we face today. What do I mean by flatter investing world? 20 years ago, 30 years ago, you could claim that your edge was that you had better data. Well, that's not going to work for you much anymore because everybody has that same data. It could be that you built a better model on a mainframe computer. Well, that's not going to work for you either because anybody can build a model. They can buy a model. And if you think about those edges that allowed you to make money in the past, they're increasingly becoming difficult to hang your hat on. One of the edges you might be able to develop is if you can deal with uncertainty a little better than everybody else, maybe that will become your edge in this new world that we face. Maybe you're going to be better at dealing with global uncertainties and technological uncertainties in investing in valuation. I'm not claiming that I have that edge, but I'm going to keep trying because I don't think I have much of an edge on data. I don't have an edge on models. And this might be the only thing I might be able to do a little better than everybody else. But even if it's not true, it's so much fun trying. Thank you very much for listening.